And we are, as a people, inherently and historically Wake up. opposed to secret societies, to Se- secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. The show that asks questions about why we don't ask questions. What the hell is going on? This is Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. Welcome to Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. These are the Conspiracy Queries, and I'm the Alan Park. And uh, we have with us today the speech that was recently made of a 93-year-old former Minister of Defense of Canada who's doing a heck of a lot more interesting things now that he's no longer the Minister of Defense. He's writing about a lot of strange topics, a lot of difficult things to understand for many. Paul Hellier is going to give a, a speech in a few minutes. And after that, uh, we have a special guest. The subjects we're talking about are just too immense to get your mind around in a few minutes. Some of my best sources, some of my prime sources, began sending me information. It got me to the point where I said, what is going on in this world of ours? Who is manipulating us? Who is pulling the strings? Who is responsible for this mess we're in because it didn't happen accidentally. So the more information that came in, the more I said, hey, I'm going to have to do what I didn't intend to do, and that is write another book and put some of this information in print so that we can get it out into the the areas of the United States and Canada and Britain and elsewhere where people need to know how they're being manipulated and that they have to do something about it and that only the people can do something about it Because your leaders, as you well know, they are in most cases well in the grips of the what I'm going to call the cabal. So let me start back even before World War II was finished. There was an organization in the United States, the Council on Foreign Relations, which decided that they should build an empire grander than any empire since and including the Roman Empire. They had huge plans for a huge empire, and they've been working at it ever since. It's sort of unfolding, more or less, as they had planned it. Well, then, uh, right after the war, there was another organization came along, and there, some people met at the Hotel de Bilderberg in uh, Holland, and they had some good intentions at the beginning to try and get a little European Union so that there wouldn't be so many wars in Europe every few years, And one had to applaud some of their initial uh, ideas, and they did some good work in the beginning. But then, as time went on, their motives changed, the composition changed somewhat, and it came under the control, really, of the international banking cartel and the banking financial institution. And it has become the apex of the most powerful cabal in the history of the world. It is so secretive, of course, as you know, you don't get in there except by invitation. I think there is only about one more secret organization that I've heard of, that's the Bank for International Settlements. Talk about secrecy. They won't even let prime ministers and ministers of finance in there to see what they're doing when they're controlling the world. And I have a friend who was very much involved in a number of areas that have interested me all along, um, sent me a title of a book to read on the BIS. It's the, sha- the, or- the uh, organization with a shady past because it had connections to the Nazis both during the 1930s and during the war that is running the world today. It's running the world because it has the input from the banking system from Wall Street and the city of London, and uh, it's, it's really the sort of the headquarters for the way that they manipulate us for their benefit and not ours, to our detriment. Well, then the third organization, after a few years, Japan became to, started to uh, build up a little bit. Zygniew Brzezinski said, well, we should have uh, a way of uh, bringing together not only Europe and America, uh, that we have already done, but we should also try and bring the Japanese in a little bit. So he suggested uh, a new trilateral commission. 
and he brought this idea to David Rockefeller. Rockefeller liked it, so he took it to the Bilderberger meeting of that year, and they liked it, and that was all he needed was to come back, all the inspiration or approval needed to come back and start the Trilateral Commission. So these three organizations are all working together. There's a lot of common membership, and I have a chapter on them called the Three Sisters. But believe me, they're powerful, and it's difficult to know who's most powerful because the Bilderbergers and the Council on Foreign Relations both say they are. Uh, One of them has to be, but maybe it's just the two of them put together. And they are, at the head, the apex of the cabal. Well, then, beneath the banking cartel... You have the oil cartel, and then you have the uh, multinational corporations, and then significant elements of the intelligence organizations, and then significant elements of the United States Armed Forces. And they're all working together. By the early post-war years, there was in the United States a shadow government that was really this cabal running the United States and using money power to manipulate. And it was so bad, it's more powerful than either the President of the United States, and incidentally they picked the the, uh, Council on Foreign Relations, the Presidents in advance, and they picked one for each party in case, you know, so it doesn't matter who gets elected. And uh, they manipulate Congress so that neither the President nor the Congress of the United States are running the United States and haven't been for 50 years. Now, there are a lot of Americans I know that, doesn't know, that don't know this and uh, would find it hard to believe, but believe me, they should find out soon before it's too late. To give you an idea of how secretive they were, right from the beginning, General Eisenhower got wind that they were doing some very interesting things in some areas of Nevada and uh, Arizona and so where He wanted to know what was going on out there, and they wouldn't tell him. And finally, he threatened to send the 3rd Army from Colorado and take over Areas 51 and S4 and so on if they wouldn't accept someone to go out and see and report to him as to what they were actually doing. So they capitulated, and I think they sent about three of his confidants out and reported to him as to what they were doing. But he's the last president that has ever done that. This, according to some good witnesses, uh, Dr. Stephen Greer Greer had, uh, a lot of you know about him, he had a witness who worked with General Eisenhower and uh, who said when General Eisenhower came out with his famous last speech, his farewell speech to Congress and the uh, people of the United States, that he, uh, when he warned us of the military-industrial complex, he really was warning us of the fact that the ET file had fallen into the wrong hands. It had fallen into civilian hands. The government had lost control. And that's what he was really thinking. Unfortunately, he didn't mention them because even then, I guess it was kind of risky to start telling the truth. Subsequent uh, presidents have all been briefed, but that you have to cut that word in half, brief, Brief briefed, and incidentally, according to uh, Grant Cameron, one of our best ufologists from out west who knows more about what presidents have known than anybody else that I've ever met, the uh, Republican presidents are told a little more of what's going on than the Democratic uh, presidents, but none of them are told very much. Uh, They're told that uh, there are extraterrestrials and they're there are several species of them, and most of them are benign and, and uh, wish nothing but good for us. Uh, but there, there's one species that is, is uh, not friendly. But they've never said who it was. And I, for one, would love to know. But uh, it would be nice if they'd come out and say so. This has been going on and uh, for a long while. And what the so-called cabal decided was that they wanted to build what they call a new world order. In politics, one of the first things you'll learn is that you should have that word new in everything. It's a new deal. It's a new day. 
It's a new policy. It's a new turn. Always new has to be in the, in the slogan. So they got the new world order, but they didn't originate it. It was originated in Germany in the 1930s. And unfortunately, the new world order that is planned today has some very similar earmarks to the ones that the one that was being followed in Germany in the uh, 1930s. So uh, we have the situation that after World War II, there were um, quite a few German scientists who were brought into the United States under uh, Operation Paperclip. And uh, President Truman distinctly told the military that they couldn't bring in anybody who had been close, had had a close association with the uh, Nazi Party. Well, if you know the military and their relationship with civilians, they uh, ignored what he said and brought in scientists who had had quite were quite high-ranking Nazis, and uh, and they were the ones who really got things going in the, the Western United States where they were replicating the uh, alien technology and developing anti-gravity ships and uh, building terrible weapons of uh, destruction and doing all of the other things. It, it has a, a, a very shady mixture that we have here, and it's kind of hard to know who's on first, but you know that the bankers are at the apex and then it sort of comes down from there except there's the unknown quantity in the whole thing is the, uh, are the extraterrestrials, uh, which, who by the, some of them, who were working with the Germans in the 1930s and during the war, and who came over with the scientists. You have a very delicate situation before 9-11, a perfectly easy situation, if the Americans had wanted to end the war, the war against terrorism, before, just before it really got going, they could have, and they didn't. And instead, uh, George W. Bush said, they envy our affluence, they envy, envy our freedom, they envy our, our democracy. That's uh, time for laughter. And, <laughs> and they envy all of these things but didn't even mention any of the things that were the real problems uh, that created the problem, the, the real fa uh, considerations that uh, were responsible for the problem. Well, then 9-11, as you know, uh, was in reaction to the uh, plan for a new American century. Uh, they had to have, as they said in their original script, <coughs> an incident like Pearl Harbor, that was in the text, and I've actually read it and put it in my books. And, of course, they've taken it out of the script now, so uh, it's no longer there for people to remind themselves. It's just uh, what was uh, being planned. Along comes Pearl Harbor, and if you look at the official report of what happened, you can find that it's just full of holes right from the beginning. And uh, there is no doubt looking back, that the high officials in the United States knew that the planes were going to be hijacked and did nothing about it. Let it happen. And not only that, but there was some help from somewhere in making sure that the buildings came down because two little planes do not create enough kinetic energy or heat energy from burning fuel to bring down one, pro one building, let alone seven. The, the, there is a fantastic book, The Use of High-Level Energy in 9-11. Anyway, you can if, Google Dr. Judy Wood. It's, it's, a really, uh, it's a really great book. And it, uh, it tells you more than many people would care to know. But if you're looking for the truth, you might as well look for the truth and not say, well, let's put some paper over it and forget it didn't happen. And, and, but what, what happened as a result of this was that they managed to turn race against race and religion against religion. And 
not only that, they increased the defense expenditures in the United States by 50%, 100% right, actually. They doubled them. So talk about the military-industrial complex coming out on top of that thing for themselves. Wow, they, they just made billions from it. And uh, some people could say that that wasn't, uh, wasn't really the thing that should have been allowed. So the, in the meantime, the, the world was changed upside down. It was just, you know, went from one kind of a world where there was a reasonable peace and reasonable cooperation to one where now we spend time killing people instead of building uh, a better world, which is what we should all be about. So uh, coming, I guess, finally to the banking uh, issue, uh, because that's one of the ones uh, that the whole thing is going. Well, I might, I might just very quickly, I'm running late already, um, the number three ETs, as the, some of you know, that the Americans have replicated spaceships. And uh, not long ago, uh, Ben Rich, the former CEO of uh, Lockheed uh, Skunk Works, where they did a lot of, uh, of um, experimentation in these areas with the back engineering of the uh, extraterrestrial uh, ships, said to uh, his uh, classmates, uh, we now have the technology to take ET home. So what they, they're doing now is building up a fleet of those, and the part of the plan, allegedly, and there are other people that believe this, but I, it makes sense to me, that after they're finished finally with the, the uh, uh, terrorists, if there's anything left of the world, then they're going to have a mock attack of uh, these ships, scare the pants off just about everybody, having made, impoverished them and put them all in debt in the meantime, so that they'll cry out for martial law and, in effect, the implementation of the New World Order. So what I've advised people, if they see them coming in a fleet like that, just wave and say hi, and uh, don't pay any attention to them otherwise. So uh, part of the, of the business, of course, is putting everybody into, uh, into debt. This brings us back to the to the question of money uh, and what it is. It's too much to tell you in five or ten minutes, but I'll just hit some of the highlights. <clears throat> Most people don't know what money is. It used to be coins and that sort of thing, and uh, it got to the point where uh, you couldn't lug a bunch of coins around if you wanted to buy a fur coat or something or other, so they started using paper money. Eventually, we got to the point where uh, we're just using electronic money, and today, money is just a computer entry. The first and, in my opinion, brightest of the governors of the, of the uh, Bank of Canada said that money is just a book entry. Well, if he were Graham Towers, if he were alive today, he would say money is nothing but a computer entry. That's all it is. <clears throat> and the reason I call them the money mafia is because we've been hearing quite a bit, and I was seeing quite a bit in the newspapers and hearing on television about the, uh, the investigation in Montreal where the mafia had been taking 2 2.5% off the top. The bankers take 95% off the top. 95%. And that means that they have leverage of 20 to 1. When the Bank of England was first uh, uh, chartered, the king uh, said, lend me all your, your 1,200,000 1, uh, pounds of uh, gold and silver at 8%, which is pretty high for a government-guaranteed loan, <clears throat> and I'll let you print an equal amount of banknotes and lend it to your rich friends at high interest rates. So in effect, they were allowed to same, lend the same money twice and collect interest from both. Well, then, over the years... They weren't satisfied with that, and they wanted a higher, uh, better deal. So in the early years of the 20th century in the United States, federally uh, chartered uh, uh, banks had to have a gold reserve of 25%. So they were allowed to save 
to lend the same money to four people and collect interest from each. In Canada, when I was young, and that's a while ago, banks had to have a cash reserve of 8%, so they could lend the same money 12 and a half times. Today, under the new rules, which were implemented in Canada in 1991, banks just have to have a capital reserve of about 5% of their total assets. They have to have what I call, say they want, we'll take a figure of $5,000, They have to have $5,000 in blood, sweat, and tears money invested. And they can take that and expand it 20 times over into credit that they can loan to students or governments or entrepreneurs or anyone else and create 100,000 out of five and then insist that the people they lend it to pay them back the 100000 in blood, sweat, and tears money, hard-earned money, plus interest. Now, that's a pretty good game, and I call it grand larceny, which it is. Until we do something about this, we're really sunk, because the banking cartel is just like a serpent, and it's going around the Western world like this, around and around, and getting us tighter and tighter and tighter, and getting us further and further in debt all the time. And what I say is that there's no remedy except to cut off the serpent's head. That's the only way you can deal with the serpent. And that means government-created money. And we could argue for quite a while about how much it should be. I'm recommending 34% in the book, because that is the figure which, after much consideration, would be enough for governments at all levels federal, provincial, municipal, to balance their books, uh, run, run uh, uh, balanced budgets, and have lots of money to build new subways and uh, take down the gardener and do a lot of other things that need to be done. At the same time, if they did it the way it's recommended in the book, and which we've been recommending to the government here, uh, they would be able to pay down the existing debt by 25 to 33% over a period of seven years, which makes a lot of sense. But that isn't going to happen unless hundreds of thousands of Canadians or in the States Americans say to the government, we want you to do it, and we want you to do it now. Not after our young people have gone through another five years of recession and lack of hope. They should be looking forward to a better future than we had and not being told, well, you can't have it as good as your your parents and your grandparents had. That's nonsense. It's more technology, more knowledge, more capital, more everything. All we need is to get a system that's designed for us. Well, the bottom line, and I'm going to skip global warming, but the bottom line is that we now have in this country a proposal to have a treaty with the European Union which includes financial organizations. And if you go back to the NAFTA and the Free Trade Agreement, we made an arrangement whereby if a foreign company, well, if if a Canadian municipality, for example, said, well, you, you can't come in here because we don't want you, they could then sue our government. And they have been for billions of dollars. What is proposed with the European uh, CETA, they call it, Canada-Europe trade agreement, is that that will include financial institutions, including banks. And that means that we can no longer do what we did after to get out of the Depression and win the war and post-war treaty, because we will have, we will have compromised our most precious right, which is the right to create our own money. In 1938... No jobs in Canada. None. 1939, along comes the war. Within a matter of months, everybody is in the armed forces or working, creating um, munitions and doing these sorts of things. And you might say, well, unemployment went to a historic low of 1%. And you might say, well, where did the government get all that money? Well, it's simple. The Bank of Canada printed it. P-R-I-N-T-E-D. Very simple. What they did was the government would give them a bond 
and, uh, and the Bank of Canada would print the money, hand it over to the government, deposit it uh, in their bank account. The government would spend that cash uh, to pay the soldiers, sailors, and airmen, and to help pay for the factories and so on. And the money that they spent into circulation was what the economists at the time called high-powered money, which meant that the banks could then use it as their 8% reserve and create 12.5% more credit so that they could help finance new factories and help people to buy war bonds and do all of these uh, other things at the same time. And uh, the system worked like a charm. And it worked like that throughout the whole post-war period. It helped us build the uh, St. Lawrence Seaway, the Trans-Canada Highway, the great new airport terminals, and to lay our, the foundation for our social security system, which was considered one of the best in the world. In 1974, without any consultation or advice, the Bank of Canada changed the system and stopped lending the government of Canada, in effect, zero-cost money. During all those years, we had had a shared system, in effect, where the money creation system was shared between the government of Canada on behalf of the people of Canada and the private banks. The Bank of Canada changed the system, stopped working for us, the shareholders, and started taking its orders from the Bank of International Settlements in Zurich, Switzerland. <clears throat> How much that's cost us in interest on the debt that we've run up because we had to borrow in the market instead of getting help from the Bank of Canada? One trillion, one hundred billion dollars. From 74, 75 to 2010, 11, a trillion, and that's T-R-I-L-L-I-A-1 or something like that. Uh, you get the point anyway. One hundred billion dollars. And just think what you could do with that much money. We could do a lot if we just had a few billion dollars then we wouldn't be arguing so much about different transportation systems. We could do two or three of them and solve the problems all at once. The cabal is responsible for the, because they're running the Bank for International Settlements, which really sold our Bank of Canada down the river, and we're paying the consequences, and we have to do something about it. Now, coming back to the treaty, if Parliament ratifies that treaty, we will no longer be able to have the Bank of Canada create money for us. Directly. And if we lose that power, we lose the power to get out of this great recession and have prosperity like we had from 1939 to 1974. In other words, it's grand, it is, and we're going to have to convince members of parliament, of all parties, that we do not want them to ratify that treatment, that treaty, and we want them to turn it down on behalf of the people, because if they don't, they're going to be traitors to this country, and that we, the people, will not put up with it. And we can stop it if we really go at it, you know, heart and soul. I don't make my business, I don't make my living from uh, selling books, but I really hope that some of you will be sufficiently interested in the future of our country and, and of the Western world that you'll get a copy and uh, read it, and if you, if you uh, like it, uh, but tell your friends about it. Maybe give a, get a couple of copies to give away for Christmas presents or something like that, because we've got to get the word out. They have the money, so they're in control. We have the numbers, but we have to mobilize them, and we have to get people working in the same team and say, we have had enough of this nonsense. We do not want a world government run by bankers and elite persons. We will cooperate through the United Nations. We will do the things that we should do in harmony because there are things we have to do together. But we ha there are things that we have to do on our own. And one of them is to decide, decide the rate of money increase in our own country to provide jobs for our own young people and unemployed and decent salaries and a, a better distribution of wealth between the wealthy and the poor. It's all possible. It's all there. And one thing I've never done, I've never written a book talking about the problems in the world or anywhere without 
putting in some solutions. So there's a solution in there for all of the major problems, including global warming, which I think you will find uh, uh, interesting. Stop the drilling in the Beaufort Sea. Stop the dri- drilling in the, in the Atlantic Ocean. Stop the drilling in the Gulf of Mexico. Stop the increase in the size of the tar sands. And stop fracking and do it now and change the world in seven years, replace the power system in every car, truck, ship, tractor, airplane, and home in the world in seven years. Is it possible? Yes. Just go back to World War II and see what we did. Every car company, every refrigerator manufacturer, every uh, stove manufacturer converted into making armaments to win the war. And we all pulled together and we won it. But I'm going over to France to look at the at the situation there and visit the, the battlefields uh, next week. And the conclusion I'm going to come to is millions of people died in vain if we let a handful of people take away all of our freedoms and make us live as debt slaves under their domination. That is not what millions of people died for. They died for freedom and the rule of law and not this business of a handful of people saying, you know, lock them up. That's the best thing to do. Throw them away and forget about them. The U.S. has a worse record than ours. They've never had a, uh, our system. That's what I'm recommending in the book. Uh, Congress sold out 101 years ago. And a, a group of uh, the richest people in the world got together in Jekyll Island and decided they would take over the money creation function. And they managed to sell... Uh, the Congress on it, uh, just before Christmas, when the congressmen were interested, more interested in uh, uh, sugar plum fairies than they were in reading the re- legislation. And uh, they handed over this prize asset that I'm talking about, hook, line, and sinker, to the richest people in the world to run for their benefit. It has cost the American people trillions and trillions of dollars that were unnecessary. And 100 years go by, and not, notwithstanding the fact that Woodrow Wilson said it was the greatest mistake that had ever been made and so on, others came to that conclusion. Congress still hasn't done anything about it. And so when I'm talking to an American audience, I say, you've got to get rid of the Fred and get, do it right away because there will be no justice in this world until the Fed is gone and you have a proper Bank of the United States that's along the lines of the Bank of Canada, publicly owned. Publicly owned, that's the key. That's the former minister, Paul Hellyer, letting you know it can only be done by taking down the cabal. So do what you can to help out. Anyway, my next guest is named Patrick White. He has a fantastic store in Toronto called Conspiracy Culture, and he's bringing a special event to town that might help us learn how we might be able to help take down anybody and everybody in the banking cabal. Patrick, Conspiracy Culture, what kind of bookstore is that that you run anyway? Well, we sell controversial and suppressed material here at Conspiracy Culture, books that you will not find in your Bilderberg-controlled chapters, Indigo, or World's Biggest. You've got a special event coming up shortly. Tell us about that. Yes, we do. It's the third year in a row that we're bringing George Norrie, who's the host of the late-night program Coast to Coast AM. We're bringing him to Toronto for a live live stage show, and the guests this year will be Giorgio Tsoukalos from Ancient Aliens, Judith Barry Baker, who was Lee Harvey Oswald's uh, ex-lover for the six, seven months leading up to the JFK assassination, R. Gary Patterson, who's pretty much considered the, the Fox Mulder of rock and roll, Peter Davenport, he... Uh, he's the director of the National UFO Reporting Center, and via Skype, we've got Alex Jones chiming in. Uh, and where is this going to be? It takes place at the Queen Elizabeth Theatre, which is located on the CNE grounds. It's a great location. All right, and that is on what day? Saturday, November 8th, 2014. All right, and we can get tickets from conspiracyculture.com, anywhere else. Yeah, and also GeorgeNoriLive.com, or if you wanted to see my face, you could come to the bookstore. 
and we'll have tickets available at the door on the day of as well. So if you want to get on the mailing list, you can call me at the shop. I'll add you on to it, no problem. All right, tell us, let's let's spend a little bit of time talking about some of these people that will be there. Tell us about Judith Very Baker. I know she is uh, amazing. What a story. She has her book at your store. Tell everybody who that is, because in the JFK saga, she's not all that well known. No, she's uh, she's recently come out onto the scene uh, less than a decade ago, and she's made some pretty significant waves. She was at one point a very promising science student who was working on a cure from, uh, for cancer. Uh, she ended up running into Lee Harvey Oswald by chance and ended up straying from a path of mainstream scholarship at uh, the U of Florida basically to a life of espionage in New Orleans with uh, Mr. Oswald himself. She was really close uh, with David Ferry, which is what the the whole point of her new book coming out is. Her new book is called uh, David Ferry, uh, Mafia Pilot, uh, Participant in Anti-Castro Bioweapon Plot, Friend of Lee Harvey Oswald, and Key to the JFK Assassination. So this woman was privy to all sorts of information. I'm sure you can imagine just just the pillow talk alone. And uh, we brought her up here in 2011 to launch her memoir called Me and Lee, How I Came to Know, Love, and Lose Lee Harvey Oswald. And we had her here for a few nights. And it just goes to show how dangerous of a person she is in regards to what she knows. Uh, The last night that she was here while having dinner at the hotel, I think there was like 13 people at the table. Uh, maybe about three minutes into the meal, Judith drops her fork and says that she thinks she's got something sharp in her mouth and that she thinks she swallowed something sharp. Uh, Sydney White was sitting next to her, uh, took her fork and started mashing through her food, and sure enough, throughout the entire meal, uh, glass shards. So she had to get rushed to the hospital and have her stomach pumped, her esophagus and, and uh, throat was pretty badly scratched. It, she, she'll be there. She's fantastic. Uh, you met her when you were down here, weren't didn't you, 2011? I, I, I did meet her, yeah. So that's incredible. So was there any lead on who might have uh, been able to put glass, ground-up glass shards in her food? Well, the hotel manager was completely uh, perplexed because he had said that no glass had broken in his uh, restaurant for quite some time and that the color of the glass was different from the glass that they would use. So he couldn't figure it out, but she had stayed at that hotel uh, the duration of her stay, and she took the media by storm. So the first three days that she was in Toronto, she was all over the media, television, radio, newspaper, you name it. That wasn't necessarily the best thing, considering people are watching and you know still paying attention to what she's talking about and to whom. So you know you can't really say much when you're chewing on glass. She came onto the scene, as you say, uh, relatively recently, like 10 years ago. I'd not read anything about her before um, in in the assassination investigations, uh, subsequently both through the government and other independent organizations over the years. Never heard of this woman. Uh, What what can you say that speaks to her veracity, that she really was a lover, or or at least in very, very close contact with um, the man known as Lee Harvey Oswald? Oh, the photographs, the, the, the handwritten love letters that she's got, you know, it's, uh, there's ample and overwhelming evidence to support a lot of what she states. And, you know, uh, Ed Haslam, who wrote the book Dr. Mary's Monkey, uh, writes about her in his work. And you can also see Judith in the, the documentary uh, the Men Who Killed Kennedy, and she's also touring the U.S. right now. She's doing uh, quite a bit, I, I, w- I want to say, down and around Texas, and she's she's being really well-received. There's lots of great feedback that I'm seeing on the net. It sounds as though she's better received uh, down there than up here in Canada, where uh, someone tried to kill her. So she's getting away with not being murdered uh, as she travels through America. Yeah, and, you know, maybe it's because she might be have a little bit more prevalence in the states with her name and who she is and what she knows whereas i mean up here in canada the population is a fraction of what it is in the u.s the media is much more consolidated so you know people up here aren't really getting exposed to any sort of alternative information uh so maybe she's more of a threat up here than she is down there or vice versa i'm not quite sure what would 
around her, the, the, the rain that she's got down there versus up here. But she hadn't been in the States uh, prior to the glass and the food. The, the Toronto stop in 2011 was her very first stop, her first time coming back to North America after fleeing the U.S. back in 63. Right. Wow. So it was, you know, oh, here she is. She's making waves. We need to, to squash this pretty quick. Let's throw some shards in her food and see if we can put an end to this. And what is her position on uh, whether or not Lee Harvey Oswald is the same one? Uh, you know, there are stories of um, body doubles and uh, which particular Lee Harvey Oswald are we talking about? Does she have an opinion on, you know, there's a lot of theories that, you know, it wasn't him at all, but some Russian sub-agent and so it goes. I remember when we had her here, uh, she was aware of the majority of the theories circulating regarding Oswald in terms of who he was, doppelgangers, doubles, uh, so on and so forth. And I remember somebody asking her specifically what she thought about that, and she did give a pretty detailed answer. Unfortunately, you know, hosting these events, uh, one of the drawbacks is that I'm usually pretty occupied managing everything, making sure nothing's falling apart. So I, I more often than not, don't have the opportunity to sit and listen and, and to hear what they have to say, which is probably the most unfortunate thing out of everything. She she knows that there's people out there who, who talk about Lee Harvey Oswald being a double or, you know, I, I just, I can't say for certain what, what she feels about it. Do we have anybody uh, coming to this one that has not been here before, not to Toronto or, or not to your event? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple, you know, for, for people that watch Ancient Aliens and the other show In Search of Aliens, which is on History Channel and H2, Giorgio A. Sukulos, he's the, he's the guy with the big hair, so it'll be his first time. Uh, Peter Davenport, the guy that directs the National UFO Reporting Center, he hasn't appeared in, in Canada, so this will be his first appearance. And uh, our Gary Patterson, who investigates everything strange and bizarre in the rock and roll realm, uh, he has yet to appear in Toronto as well. So, so three of them will be making their their Toronto debut. Our Gary Patterson has the um, what? What are the books he has? He's got uh, a, a Beatles book and a, uh, I think it's a Doors. Um, a lot of work on the Doors as well with Jim Morrison. Yeah, the the first book he wrote, I believe, was called Hellhounds on Their Trail. Uh, which got into a lot, I guess, more of the paranormal and the darker aspects of rock and roll. So, you know, getting into the Leonard Skinner curses, the Zeppelin curse, the 27 Club, uh, looking at the bizarre, um, you know, surroundings, uh, Laurel Canyon, uh, Jimmy Page and Aleister Crowley, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it'll be interesting, you know, whether you're a fan of music or the strange and, and paranormal and bizarre. Uh, he, he's fantastic. He's quite an interesting character. I'm I'm actually looking forward to to hearing what R. Gary has to say. I'm a little bit skeptical uh, um, recently of a lot of these um, award show presentations that that, that kind of uh, sort of dominate. There seems to be one every two or three weeks on television, um, and they're filled with you know what is what is described as Illuminati symbolism, including the set pieces and, and the lighting and the theme of the show and just a lot of uh, shaping of ideas and events under the guise of entertainment. Oh, for sure. And music is one of the most uh, profound ways of, of capturing consciousness and attention. And, you know, regardless as to whether or not you subscribe to the ideas of, you know, invisible forces and occult aspects and, and, dark aspects you know i think the the first time lucifer is depicted in scripture he's they, they speak of him being uh covered in precious gems and stones and you know i guess that's what you would refer to as the bling and he was also holding uh <laughs> tendrils and flutes so he was u utilizing music uh in a way that a lot of people wouldn't understand and when you see people at concerts and you see the way they're all swaying back and forth in almost a, a consensus trance and people talking about the vibe, you know, the vibration and the vibe at the party was really good. You know, there's, there's definitely something to music and the way they use it. And, you know, we all know that these people at the top of the charts these days aren't there because of their skill sets. They're there because 
the powers that be want them to be at the pinnacle of entertainment because that's where all the youth are staring and in order to subvert the minds of the young who better to, to, to use than these like crazy freaks that are seemingly everywhere in the media these days like you said i've come to understand that there there is a handful of people that actually write uh, all of these songs for uh not all of them but a heck of a lot of the top hits i guess you'd call them of of some of the bigger marquee names across the board whether they're boy bands or or a female singer uh like uh taylor uh, what's her <laughs> what's her name Taylor, Taylor Swift. Swift and and these others and it's like this one Swedish guy named Max something. I have to get him on the show. I want to see how he does it. It's like he's got some kind of template. And yeah. Katy Perry's got hits from him. Every every single top Lady Gaga, uh, uh, Justin Bieber. I mean, it's all coming out of one place. Oh, for sure. And if you if you go back far enough and see where the original archetype stems from, you know. There's a, there's an interesting movie called Metropolis. It's like uh, done in the early 1900s by a guy named Fritz Lang. It's a black and white film. But there's a, there's a, a chapter called The Dance of the Whore of Babylon, where the I guess the the, the star of the film is sort of trying to hypnotize uh, the workers and just to shift their consciousness. And what's interesting is if you look at Beyonce and Madonna and Janet Jackson. Uh, a lot of these big stars over the last, you know, 15, 20 years, every single one of them has performed the dance that's in that movie, Fritz Lang's Metropolis, uh, done in that chapter called The Dance of the Whore of Babylon. So it's interesting that the, the dance itself is called The Dance of the Whore of Babylon, and here you've got all these pop, pop, pop icons, female pop icons. Uh, doing you know, it. Doing it, exactly, like cho- choreographed to a T. You know, even wearing the same golden metallic uh outfit to, to represent the, the robot in the film that's doing it. Like, bro, how does this stuff happen? You know what I mean? Yeah, over and over again. So let's go back to that movie, uh, Metropolis. Who came up with the idea that that particular dance move that needed to be uh, wrapped up in a, in a gold uh, outfit or a silver outfit, who, who came up with that in the first place and what is its a symbolic significance because if people are copying it it's the thing itself we need to be looking at well i'm guessing that it probably really does go back to the time of babylon when everything was you know sort of we're, we're coming full circle to to that time again you know uh they always say as in the days of noah and i think we're, we're coming to a time where it's getting horrible i mean just look at the shit that's going on out there bro it's like so so perverse and so disgusting but I'm guessing that the dance came from a time back in the days of Babylon where if you were to perform this dance, you would probably somehow seduce whoever it was that was in the room. You know, there's there's probably something very significant to every one of the movements. So in this case, as a viewer, then then you're being then they're seducing everyone that's watching, whether it's on a, 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 a ancient uh, movie screen in a theater back in the 30s or, or uh, YouTube now. Sure, and again, you know, when you're dealing with that kind of money, these guys have it all figured out. You know, it's it's a it's a science to these people, and uh, in the same way that they're utilizing certain chords and certain musical structures to uh, to capture attention, you know, same way they're utilizing certain color schemes and and certain shapes and sacred geometry in the videos themselves to to create a visual uh, stimulation, you know, or, or to capture the mind through a, a visual. Yeah. And, and a lot of what we watch in the, in the most popular music videos today are just reenactments of ancient Masonic ceremonies or black, black magic rituals. Right. And, and this is what, you know, every parent is like foisting onto their 10 to 14 year old. And then they wonder why when the kids 16, 17, 18, they're, straight out of their head and they can't control them in any shape or form yeah <laughs> so it's like and it's crazy it's crazy it is it is crazy but uh so thank you very much for organizing the event tell us again the name of it sure so it's called george nori live in toronto it's the third installment uh george nori comes and interviews a bunch of guests on stage all sorts of subject matter and then when the show wraps up everybody has an opportunity to meet all the guests take some photos get some autographs great place to network and meet like-minded individuals and you know to, to really foment and foster that sense of community which is so typically void in this type of arena 
and uh, all the details and information and tickets can be obtained at conspiracyculture.com. That's right, and and also uh, your store itself, Conspiracy Culture. Uh, where is that? After recently uh, moving from uh, the hallowed Parkdale location, you're now up on Bloor Street in Toronto. Give us the address. That's right. We're stepping on up, but <laughs> <laughs> So now we're at 1344 Bloor Street West. We're on the north side of Bloor, just west of Lansdowne. If you're taking TTC, Lansdowne Station is like a minute and 40-second walk. We're right across the street from the Value Village. That's Patrick White of Conspiracy Culture, who with Kadina, his partner, uh, they put a great effort into peeling back some of the layers. Pop in sometime and and, uh, read something there. Talk to Patrick and uh, maybe buy a book. Thanks a lot, Patrick. Thank you, Alan Park. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. Please offer comments or complaints by emailing conspiracyqueries at gmail.com or on Twitter at con underscore queries or at our website, conspiracyqueries.com. Thanks for listening.